Hello, squirrel listeners. Oh, boy, did I get up feeling rough as a cob. But I hate to keep whinging about it, but oh, my gosh, I thought I for real had the flu. But prayers and possibly antibiotics finally kicking in. I think I'm getting better, I hope. Hope and pray, and I hope you all are doing well. <laughs> yeah, I got my fruit punch water. Chapter 3 of Anne's House of Dreams. This is called The Land of Dreams Among. Have you made up your mind who you're going to have to the wedding, Anne? Asked Mrs. Rachel Lynn as she hemstitched table napkins industriously. It's time your invitations were sent, even if they are to be only informal ones. I don't mean to have very many, said Anne. We just want those we love best to see us marry. Gilbert's people and Mr. and Mrs. Allen and Mr. and Mrs. Harrison. There was a time when you'd hardly have numbered Mr. Harrison among your dearest friends, said Marilla dryly. Well, it wasn't very strongly attracted. I wasn't very strongly attracted to him at our first meeting, acknowledged Anne with a laugh over the, over the recollection. But Mr. Harrison has improved on acquaintance, and Mrs. Harrison is really a dear. Then, of course, there are Miss Lavender and Paul. Have they decided to come to the island this summer? I thought they were going to Europe. They changed their minds when I wrote them I was going to be married. I had a letter from Paul today. He says he must come to my wedding, no matter what happens to Europe. That child always idolized you, remarked Mrs. Rachel. That child is a young man of 19 now, Mrs. Lynn. How time does fly, was Mrs. Lynn's brilliant and original response. Charlotta the fourth may come with them. She sent word by Paul that she would come if her husband would let her. I wonder if she still wears those enormous blue bows and whether her husband calls her Carlotta or Le Leonora. I should love to have Charlotta. Did I say Carlotta? Charlotta at my wedding. Charlotta and I were at a wedding long sign. They expect it. They expect to be at Echo Lodge next week. Then there are Phil and the Reverend Joe's. Joe, it sounds awful to hear you speaking of a minister like that, Anne, said Mrs. Rachel severely. His wife calls him that. She should have more respect for his holy office then, retorted Mrs. Rachel. I've heard you criticize ministers pretty sharply yourself, teased Anne. Yes, but I do it reverently, <laughs> protested Mrs. Lynn. You never heard me nickname a minister, and smothered a smile. Well, there are Diana, and Fred, and little Fred, and small Aunt Cordelia, and Jane Andrews. I wish I could have Miss Stacy and Aunt Jamesina and Priscilla and Stella, but Stella's in Vancouver and Pris is in Japan. And Miss Stacy is married in California, and Aunt Jamesina has gone to India to explore her daughter's mission field. In spite of her horror of snakes, it's really dreadful the way people get scattered over the globe. The Lord never intended it, that's what, said Mrs. Rachel authoritatively. In my young days, people grew up and married and settled down where they were born or pretty near it. Thank goodness you've stuck to the island, Anne. I was afraid Gilbert would insist on rushing off to the ends of the earth when he got through college and dragging you with him. If everybody stayed where he was born, places would soon be filled up, Mrs. Lynn. Oh, I'm not going to argue with you, Anne. I'm not a B.A. What time of the day is the ceremony to be? We've decided on noon, high noon, as the society reporters say. That will give us time to catch the evening train to Glen St. Mary. And you'll be married in the parlor? No, not unless it rains. We mean to be married in the orchard with the blue sky over us and the sunshine around us. Do you know when and where I'd like to be married if I could? 
It would be at dawn, a June dawn, with a glorious sunrise and roses blooming in the gardens, and I would slip down and meet Gilbert, and we would go together to the heart of the beech woods, and there under the green arches, that would be like, like a splendid cathedral, we would be married. Marilla sniffed scornfully, and Mrs. Lynn looked shocked. But that would be terrible queer, Anne. It sounds like my mom. Why, it wouldn't really seem legal, and what would Mrs. Harmon Andrews say? Ah, there's the rub, sighed Anne. There are so many things in life we cannot do because of the fear of what Mrs. Harmon Andrews would say. Tis true, tis pity, and pity tis, tis true. What delightful things we might do if it were not for Mrs. Harmon Andrews. By times, Anne, I don't quite feel sure I understand you all together, complained Mrs. Lynn. Anne was always romantic, you know, Mrs. Marilla, said Marilla apologetically. Well, married life will most likely cure her of that, Mrs. Rachel responded comfortingly. Anne laughed and slipped away to Lover's Lane where Gilbert found her, and neither of them seemed to entertain much fear or hope that their married life would cure them of romance. The Echo Lodge people came over the next week, and Green Gables buzzed with the delight of them. Miss Lavender had changed so little. Oh. It's time to take my medicine. I even set alarms for that. Oh, mercy me. Let's see. Uh, the echo. Okay, Miss Lavender had changed so little that the three years since her last island visit might have been a watch in the night, but Anne gasped with amazement over Paul. Could this splendid six feet of manhood be the little Paul of Avonlea school days? You really make me feel old, Paul, said Anne. Why, well, I have to look up to you. You'll never grow old, teacher, said Paul. You're one of the fortunate mortals who have found and drunk from the fountain of youth. You and Mother Lavender, see here. When you're married, I won't call you Miss Mrs. Blythe. To me, you'll always be teacher, the teacher of the best lessons I ever learned. I want to show you something. The something was a pocket full of poems. Paul had put some of his beautiful fancies into verse and magazine editors had not been un as unappreciative as they are sometimes supposed to be. Anne read Paul's poems with delight. They were full of charm and promise. You'll be famous yet, Paul. I always dreamed of having one famous pupil. He was to be college president, but a great poet would be even better. Someday I'll be able to, bo able to boast that I'll whip the distinguished Paul Irving. <laughs> But then I never did whip you, did I, Paul? What an opportunity lost. I think I kept you in at recess, however. You may be famous yourself, teacher. I've seen a good deal of your work these last three years. No, I know what I can do. I can write pretty fanciful little sketches that children love and editors send welcome checks for, but I can do nothing big. My only chance for earthly immortality is a corner in your memoirs. Charlotta the Fourth had discarded the blue bows, but her freckles were not noticeably less. I never did think I'd come down to marrying a Yankee, Miss Shirley, ma'am, she said, but you never know, know what's before you, and it isn't his fault he was born that way. You're a Yankee yourself, Charlotta, since you've married one. Miss Shirley, ma'am, I'm not, and I wouldn't be if I was to marry a dozen Yankees. Tom's kind of nice, and be besides, I thought I'd better not be too hard to please, for I mightn't get n another chance. Tom don't drink, and he don't growl because he has to work between meals. And when all's said and done, I'm satisfied, Miss Shirley, ma'am. Does he call you Leonora? asked Anne. Goodness no, Miss Shirley, ma'am. I wouldn't know who he meant if he did. Of course, when we got married, he had to say, I take thee, Leonora. And I declare to you, Miss Shirley, ma'am, I've had the most dreadful feeling ever since that. Ever since that, it wasn't me he was talking to. 
and I haven't been rightly married at all. So, and so you're going to be married yourself, Miss Shirley, ma'am. I always thought I'd like to marry a doctor. It'd be so handy when the children had measles and croup. Tom is only a bricklayer, but he's real good-tempered. When I said to him, says I, Tom, can I go to Miss Shirley's wedding? I mean to go anyhow, but I'd like to have your consent. He just says, suit yourself, Charlotta, and you'll suit me. That's a real pleasant kind of husband to have, Miss Shirley, ma'am. Philippa and Reverend Joe arrived at Green Gables the day before the wedding. Ann and Phil had a rapturous meeting with presently shimmered, which presently simmered down to a cozy confidential chat over all that had been and was about to be. Queen Anne, you're as queenly as ever. I've got fearfully thin since the babies came. I'm not half so good looking, but I think Joe likes it. There's not such a contrast between us, you see. Oh, and oh, it's perfectly magnificent that you're going to marry Gilbert. Roy Gardner wouldn't have done at all. At all. I can see that now, though I was horribly disappointed at the time. You know, Anne, you did treat Roy very badly. He has recovered, I understand, smiled Anne. Oh, yes, he's married, and his wife's a sweet little thing, and they're perfectly happy. Everything works together for good, Joe, and the Bible say, and they're pretty good authorities. Are Alec and Alonzo married yet? Alec is, but Alonzo isn't. How those dear old days at Patty's place come back when I'm talking to you, Anne. What fun we had. Have you been to Patty's place lately? Oh, yes, I go off, and Miss Patty and Miss Maria still sit by the fireplace and knit. And that reminds me, we brought you a wedding gift from them, Anne. Guess what it is? <laughs> I never could. <laughs> How did they know I was going to? Be married. Oh, I told them I was there last week, and they were so interested. Two days ago, Miss Patty wrote me a note asking me to call, and then she asked if I would take her gift to you. What would you wish most from Patty's place, Ann? <laughs> you can't mean that Miss Patty has sent me her china dog dogs? Go up head. They're in my trunk this very moment, and I have a letter for you. Wait a moment. I'll get it. Dear Miss Shirley, Miss Patty had written, Marie and I are very much interested in hearing of your approaching nuptials. We send you our best wishes. Maria and I never married, but we have no objection to other people doing so. <laughs> we are sending you the China Dogs. D-O-G-S. I'd say it like D-A-W-G-S. Because I'm a good Southerner. Dog. I intended to leave them to you in my will because you seem to have a sincere affection for them, but Marie and I expect to live a good while yet. DV in parentheses. So I haven't, I have decided to give you the dogs while you are young. You will not have forgotten that Gog looks to the right and Magog to the left. Just fancy those lovely old dogs sitting by the fireplace in my house of dreams, said Anne rapturously. I never expected anything so delightful. That evening, Green Gables hummed with preparations for the following day, but in the twilight, Anne slipped away. She had a little pilgrimage to make on this last day of her girlhood, and she must make it alone. She went to Matthew's grave in the little poplar-shaded Avonlea graveyard, and there kept a silent tryst with old memories and immortal loves. How glad Matthew would be tomorrow if he were here, she whispered, but I believe he does know and is glad of it somewhere else. I've read somewhere that our dead are never dead until we have forgotten them. Matthew will never be dead to me, for I could never forget him. She left on his grave the flowers she had brought and walked slowly down the long hill. It was a gracious evening, full of delectable lights and shadows. In the west was a sky of mackerel clouds, crimson and amber-tinted, with long strips of apple-green sky between. Beyond was the glimmering radiance of a sunset tea, and the ceaseless voice of many waters came up from the tawny shore. 
something that went my whistle. <sighs> Where was Tony Shore? All around her, lying in the fine, beautiful country silence, were the hills and fields and woods she had known and loved so long. History repeats itself, said Gilbert, joining her as she passed the Blythe Gate. Do you remember our first walk down this hill and our first walk together anywhere, for that matter? I was coming home in the twilight from Matthew's grave, and you come out of the gate, and I swallowed the pride of years and spoke to you. And all heaven opened before me, supplemented Gilbert. From that moment, I looked forward to tomorrow. When I left you at your gate that night and walked home, I was the happiest boy in the world. Anne had forgiven me. I think you had the most to forgive. I was an ungrateful little wretch. And after you really saved my life that day on the pond, too. How I loathed, loathed that load of obligation at first. I don't deserve the happiness that has come to me. Gilbert laughed and clasped tighter the girlish hand that wore his ring. Anne's engagement ring was a circlet of pearls. She had refused to wear a diamond. I've never really liked diamonds since I found out they weren't the lovely purple I had dreamed of. They will always suggest my old disappointment. But pearls are for tears, the old legend says, Gilbert had objected. I'm not afraid of that, and tears can be happy as well as sad. My very happiest moments have been when I had tears in my eyes. When Marilla told me I might stay at Green Gables. When Matthew gave me the first pretty dress I ever had. When I heard that you were going to recover from the fever. So give me pearls for our troth ring, Gilbert. And I'll willingly accept the sorrow of life with its joys. But tonight our lovers thought only of joy and never of sorrow. For the morrow was their wedding day and their house of dreams awaited them on the misty purple shore of Four Winds Harbor. And that's all of chapter three. And chapter four is called The First Bride of Green Gables. So we'll read that tomorrow. Good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. <laughs> Y'all get a glimpse of some fiber before I show. <laughs> I know I only show y'all ever. Um, well, almost. I finished a witch hat. Isn't this so pretty? This is that yarn bee glowing and it's the color is called Sage S-A-G-E in song. I think it's so pretty. So this is the length of it, I guess, and then the width will be long to wrap around. I love when I knit to make that easy triangle scarf, and when I crochet to do the mouth stitch and rock rectangular, I thought it said rectangular. And I love to just do plain old vanilla beanies, knitted beanies. This is gonna be so. And this is that, uh, keep showing you things upside down. This is discontinued yarn, and I hate that because I love it. 53% wool and the rest acrylic. And it is, it's called Amazing. Not Amazing Lace. They do have that. Just Amazing. And this colorway is called Regatta. Punch of the water. When I think Regatta, I think of. Say, sailing ship, say, sailboats, sailboat races. There might be another regatta, but anyway. So, yes, I'm still working on Madonna's Fringe, but since I've been sick, y'all, Lord of mercy, I woke up and thought I was going to pass on. <laughs> but 
Lots of prayers later. I'm feeling better. A little weak-eyed, though, but I'm going to be fine. <laughs> Thanks for all your prayers, and I'm praying for all of you. And I will hope to be live at 5 today. Remember about the time change. We feel back an hour. So 5 o'clock would be 6 o'clock for some of you that didn't change, I guess. I reckon that's right. <laughs> okay, love you bunches. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. And like I said, hope, hope to be able to be on at five. I should be. Okay, bye-bye.